um, total Part B prescription drug spending is around $18 billion. So again, a massive amount of spending taking place under the program. Um, under Part B, there is no out-of-pocket cap. So when a patient is prescribed a drug that's extremely expensive, responsible for 20% of it, they're responsible for paying that 20% indefinitely. And there is nothing that's going to stop that cost from going through the roof. Um, again, the ARP is interested in more than just the consumer's perspective. We obviously have an interest in maintaining the sustainability of the programs that our consumers rely, our members rely on. Um, Medicare Part B is responsible for the other 80%. So keep that in mind when I'm talking about these numbers. That is a huge burden for them to shoulder. The other part of Medicare that is concerns prescription drugs is Medicare Part D. That is where outpatient prescription drugs are handled, the ones you pick up at the prescription counter. Um, the, the, the actual benefit itself is a little complex. I've added a graphic that hopefully helps explain it. Um, but the long and short of it is, there is an out-of-pocket cap under Medicare Part D, which is helpful. Unfortunately, you can still have cost sharing once you reach catastrophic. It's roughly 5%. So for example, Humira, a common biologic, the cost sharing for that is still $100, which again, when you're looking at income of around $22,000, can get excessive. Um, it's also, excuse me, um, there's also no real incentive for Part D plans to control spending because of the way that the benefit is structured. After a certain point, um, after they hit catastrophic, you can see Medicare is responsible for, once again, 80%. The plan pays 15 and the enrollee is 5 So the plan is kind of off the hook when you're on a very expensive drug and they blow through it pretty, this benefit very quickly because once you reach the 4500 or 4515 out of pocket, you're through the benefit, and then the government is on the hook for the 80%. So again, that's something that increases um, Medicare Part D spending, which was $62.5 billion in 2012. We also focus on private insurance. Again, we're a 50-plus organization, so Medicare is, although it seems like it might be the only thing we focus on, we, we keep an eye on the entire market. Um, and Medicare Part D kind of leads the way for what we're seeing in private insurance. So an increasing number of employer-sponsored plans are using uh, fourth, or fourth tiers where there's co-insurance as opposed to a co-pay involved. So you're going to see co-insurance uh, co in the 30% range, which again, if you're talking about a drug that's X thousand dollars per month, 30% of that is a substantial amount of money. Um, something else that's been pointed out recently in some of the uh, PBM drug trend reports is that the quote-unquote relatively low cost sharing, which again is 30% of thousands of dollars, is threatening to increase cost sharing for other drugs. So. These, the costs associated with the very expensive drugs are going to be seen throughout the system through increased premiums and increased cost sharing, regardless of whether you're taking a drug yourself, which is something that we're having a really hard time explaining to people. Uh, the exchange plans, which have recently come onto the market, are also, uh, they, they do have an out-of-pocket maximum, which is extremely helpful. However, the co-insurance associated with some of the expensive drugs can be anywhere from 40 to 60 percent, which is extremely high and certainly increases the possibility that someone is just going to walk away from the pharmacy counter. If you walk up and you're told you're owed thousands of dollars, I'm not sure there are too many people that have that in their reserves to just go ahead and pay that money until they hit their out-of-pocket cap. Um, the one thing I do like to make clear when I'm talking about cost sharing and co-insurance issues is that the problem is not the problem is cost sharing, but the underlying problem and the thing that needs to be kept in mind is the reason the cost sharing is so high is because the price of the products is high. And that seems to be something that gets lost in the conversation a lot. So as far as our perspective on what we've seen in TTIP thus far, um, ARP has been strongly, strongly opposed to 12 years of market exclusivity. So obviously 12 years of data exclusivity is something that we find completely unacceptable. Um, the FTC released a report effectively reaching the same conclusions where they they believe that it not only is unnecessary but also can have a negative impact on innovation and we you know thought of having that extended worldwide is a little concerning for us um, we also have a problem with evergreening uh, we think that manufacturers should have to demonstrate a clear significant clinical advantage in order to receive additional exclusivity um, we've also been struck by the fact that the administration keeps releasing budget proposals that actually speaks to both of these issues, suggesting reducing exclusivity and suggesting eliminating evergreening, and yet somehow it has ended up in TTIP. We've also been out front on naming, biosimilar naming. Um, we do think that is a serious problem, and I understand that there are some provisions that might speak to this. Um, we believe that different INNs is actually a patient safety issue. It can lead to confusion. It requires prescribers to memorize you know, hundreds of drugs with comparable effects. And obviously, you know, they already are struggling with coverage ideas and different benefit designs, and asking them to remember all of the drugs on the market as well seems 
a little um, difficult. Uh, we also have concerns about the fact that that's going to effectively remove the existing safety information from the, that has been gained through having the brand name Biologic on the market. Um, and finally, and probably most importantly, having different INNs is not going to help substitution, which is the primary way that biosimilars are going to reduce costs. Um, and that obviously is a huge concern because it effectively makes it where biosimilars aren't going to have the effect that obviously we want. And as I've mentioned several times today, um, ARP is not pleased by the fact that this process has not been particularly transparent. Um, it seems a little ridiculous that a lot of our intel is coming from groups that are calling us from the outside because we can't find anything other than that. It, it just seems like something that has such a broad impact and has such a broad impact particularly on our members should be a lot more open and should, we should be able to be involved a little bit more. Um, we also are concerned by the fact that it seems like industry is getting preferential access, they're getting preferential treatment, they can access things that you know, it would be nice if we could have as well. Um, and we think that should also be considered. Um, and finally, we also, and this probably just speaks more broadly, we really believe that the final agreement should not prioritize profits over people, and that seems to be kind of the direction that things are heading. Okay, I'm just going to close out with a little bit of thoughts about implications of, you know, everything goes south and everything gets in there that we're not particularly pleased about. Um, number one, CBO has found that reducing the exclusivity period for brand name biologics could save taxpayer funded programs, which again, it's important to keep in mind the programs that AARP is trying to protect are funded by taxpayers. So it's not just us trying to protect our own. This is something that impacts everyone whether they recognize it or not. Um, obviously, you want those savings and agreeing to an exclusivity period and setting it in place, those savings will be eliminated. That will no longer be an option, which obviously is not ideal. Um, and of course, there are plenty of other provisions. I'm just focus focusing on these, but there are other provisions that could be equally problematic in terms of spending. You know, anything that pu pushes up prescription drug costs, pushes up prescription drug spending, that's something that's going to come back to the American public, and that's something they need to understand. And then my usual final thought on that the number one word that I hear associated with prescription drugs these days is unsustainable. Um, they're not sustainable for patients, they're not sustainable for patients, they're not sustainable for government programs. People are not, if the trajectory of the industry continues the way that it's going, people are not going to be able to afford their prescription drugs. And there needs to be some level of adequate competition in order to help them afford the drugs that they need. And then the one final thought I always like to throw in is that medical advances are meaningless unless people can afford to use them. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Uh, for